that's your phone. You've got audio, it's like gonna feedback on <laughs> well, hey everybody. I, I, I think we made it. I think we made it. Uh, hopefully we're getting audio to the rest of the world. Uh, for those of you who are in the house already, please, in the comments, if you can hear us and the stream is actually working, give us a shout. <laughs> hey. Because we're totally winging it, of course. <laughs> <laughs> That's how it's done around here. Howdy. What's up, Carlos? What's up, Wayne? What? Can you hear us? <laughs> this feels like Bueller. Bueller. <laughs> All is well. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Here we are. We are in business. We're, we're, in, we're up. We're functional. We don't know what the hell's going on. All new equipment. All new set. Uh, a whole bunch of and a whole new batch of mistakes to make stuff supposedly plugged into other stuff that it either is working or isn't working and um this is our our main voyage episode one season two yes coming to you live from uh malcontents media world headquarters yeah it's gonna be like uh <laughs> apparently the guitar version of between two ferns <laughs> Yeah, that was like a last, that was just the last minute sort of, you know what would be cool? You know what, you know what would be really sort of overdone and, uh, yeah, and uh, obnoxious, but um, everybody went, yeah, that would be great. So I guess. I think it's great. I think it's great. It's the perfect amount of cheddar. <laughs> okay, man, nice. How, hope everybody's doing great. Uh, yeah, belated Happy New Year, everybody. Belated Happy New Year. Um, we, we didn't intend to be down for this long, but... Life intervenes. Life intervenes. And, uh, and like, we're always talking about, like, the shipping uh, delays and everything for, for Fred and Sound City. It's like, that was the case with a lot of this gear that we needed to do this. And down to the wire, I had to go get a little tripod because the one that I had was not right and it didn't fit in the set and uh, so i went to a few places and uh <clears throat> talked to a guy and they had these two nice little tripods and one of them was slightly taller than the other one and i was thinking i don't know i think it's this one it might be this one and he says well we have one of each in stock it's the last one of each we have in stock so i went okay i'm gonna have to make a decision so i got the smaller one and as I'm sitting at the counter, checking out the other taller one that was the last one they have had in stock, the customer in line behind me bought that one. Yeah. I almost bought both of them and figured I'd take <laughs> the wrong one back. Right. But I threw caution to the wind, and then I turned around and, oh, geez. Now it's really gone. But it turned out I, I picked the right one. So yeah. uh, we're just kind of skidding across the starting line and uh face down and um yeah uh, we, we we had a little discussion uh late last year kind of like do we want to continue doing the show i think it was steve kind of feeling me out a little bit like <laughs> do you want to do this do we believe in it do we want to continue doing it and uh when we both kind of agreed yeah this is a lot of fun and uh we want to contribute more, you know, to the guitar sphere or whatever we want to call it. We just thought that 
okay, what can we do to make it better, right? And this isn't, the, the backdrop isn't making it better. Like we have a lot of things planned that we thought that we could, I guess, service you guys better by being in the same room, right? <laughs> he said service. I, I did. <laughs> I'll probably say that more than once. <laughs> yeah, um, well, I, I basically, I didn't want to feel, I felt like, is this thing going to continue rolling or am I imposing on your time because you've been really busy, you've been doing a million projects and a whole bunch of different things with your life. And I just thought, okay, let's just, let's just put all our cards on the table. And, and Joe was like, no, I love it. We can, we, if, yeah. if we can up the game and uh, keep doing it, we've got a lot of, you know, we've got a lot of raw material that we haven't ground through yet. Like I said, that, the end of the year turned out to be a real scramble right and um and it's been a scramble i'm sure you guys are feeling the same thing oh absolutely every single day you think okay this is the week i finally got my giant list of things kind of whittled down to the point where it's manageable and then you walk out the door the next day and there's like a whole new pile outside your front doorstep hey i'm a failure again yeah <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, uh, oh, so, yeah. Yeah. Hope, so hope, here we are. Hope and, you guys uh, are all like. And and I, I wish we could hear the collective oohs and ahs by our cool backdrop, but we can't. So we have to give it to ourselves, right? A little bit of a hand, golf clap. But you know what? Um, well, do we want to talk about that first, or do we want to like sip some water and talk about drinks? I mean, that's kind of the the malcontents tradition. Yeah, I'm well, gonna have a little water sip sip. This is um, water. Sure. Well, it's always it's always fun to share, and we've been seeing some of the comments of you guys, and yeah. pretty much all the comments are, "Yeah, I'm ready with my glass." So, always. Although you know what, I guys, I'm not seeing any drink. Yeah, <laughs> seventh drink heaven between two ferns. You got it, brother. <laughs> uh, yeah. Hey, no. No drink comments yet. All right. Is it because it's Friday and not Saturday? Could be. Oh, there we go. Wayne chiming in. <laughs> Wonderful. Um, well, uh, nothing for nothing. Um, I actually didn't go out of my way to um, find uh, some special you know, treat to, it, it to found you to wag about it found me, uh, my, my awesome, awesome team at work all went in together and bought me a, a bottle for my birthday, which was, um, in January last third week of January. And, um, it's the weirdest thing. So for 20 odd years, 25, Roughly, That's my ber my my birthday falls in the same week as Nam. <laughs> That's so right. So, in the early days of Nam, it was great. Um, we'd go down to the show, set up uh, Thursday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, Friday, Wednesday night, get the booth all set up, go out, start hitting the bottle. And then come dragging in the first day, Thursday morning, and just pound it all the way through, except Sunday when you had to dry out enough to unload, tear down the, the NAM display and unload everything. So that was the day that you, you nursed the worst hangover that you probably had and got the stuff out. But, but it always, I always felt like it was an imposition on my birthday because. It was, you know, there wasn't any NAM show. I think there was one time, one or two times in 25 years where, where we were out of there the day before my birthday. Mm, yeah. And on one particular time, we were late getting out. So we were there um, s Monday unloading and we were really, really late and we were tired and we were filthy and we were late and we um, we had to go back to the factory and unload everything at the factory 
And then everybody was starving and thirsty and hungry. So I called this really nice French restaurant uh, in the valley here and uh, called Mistral. Been going there for a really long time. Mm. It's really great. And I called the uh, I called them and I talked to the maitre d and I said, "Hey, uh, we're not, we're on a first name basis. Not bragging. Just been going there for so long." And uh, I said, "We're." You can be on a first name basis. I said, we're tired, it. we're hungry, we're filthy, we smell bad. And he says, come on down. So we all went down there and had a really, really nice dinner and then got out. But a, a, that was the exception. Every other year has just been working it in there. And it was fun for a while. And then I started thinking, you know, it's not fun anymore. But the other day I started going, you know, I don't know. Maybe having the, the birthday at NAM is not so bad after all, but we're not doing NAM in January. And the, the next NAM show is going to be in uh, June, June, July, I guess, middle of the year. And summer is, summer NAM is going to be in the winter NAM location this year. So are you going to do it? We're going to be there. We're not going to exhibit. We're not going to, oh, we're okay. not going to haul our asses out there. Right. Mainly because we have, we're so pack ordered mm. that. You just need all hands on deck. It's kind of fruitless to go go down there to pitch our wares when all of our dealers already have orders in with us that by the time yeah. a, the summer show comes around, we're still not going to have fully shipped them. So yeah. it, it, it's, you're, it's you're almost kind of more business for what? Yeah. I mean, when it's when it's rolling like that and mm -hmm. we hope that it's still rolling like that when that comes around. But we'll go down there, you know, to service the relationship, hang out. So you'll hang it, man, because actually, guys, um, fast forward, that's kind of what we're going to talk about primarily in this show is kind of what's on the docket yeah. uh, for the company this year. And, uh, you know, in regards to the things that will be tentatively are going to be released, you're the Wizard of Oz. I don't know. I'm just going to ask you questions. Well, so yeah, that's what we're going to be talking about primarily. Yeah, I mean, I, I counted. There was a somebody. Um, Somebody texted me today, one of our dealers texted me today to ask me if we're going to make a product uh, that's basically a reissue of something that we haven't made for a long time. Oh. And and uh, and I said, uh, I said, we hadn't really thought about it. And uh, uh, but that isn't to say that it's impossible. It's just to say that after summer nam and we see how things going and see how far i've gotten through my list of 15 product development projects right. between now and then yeah. one product development project generally takes uh 18 months wow wow <laughs> so going by that uh, i've got 30 years of work to do ahead of me <laughs> chop, chop. Yeah. <laughs> better, better get to chopping. What are we doing? But uh but it it won't take 30 years, but it could very well could. Yeah. Uh so then you had a birthday. So then yeah. The, and then you the, had a bottle. And then I had a of. and then I had a bottle and and uh and you know all my all my peeps know what I'm what a tequila head I am and uh um um, you probably can't see that, but I'll just tell you it's art, art nom selection. This is uh, the art nom selection 1146. Now, what this is is uh, a, a brand uh, Las Hoyas de Agave, and uh, there's there's several um, uh, there's there's several master blenders that blend for this brand, and each one has their their own blend number i see that 11 it's 46. totally like master builders at the fender custom shop exactly only in liquid only built in custom. liquid form and um uh i've tried one of the other ones and it was fantastic normally they have a little booklet that comes with it that they that tells you the story of the blender that did this particular bottle so each different blender has a, a unique area and a unique sort of signature uh um and they so they have a variety of expressions and they're all really interesting and most of them are just plain good uh this one 
Uh, the master blender on the 1146 is uh, Enrique Fonseca. And uh, this is aged three years. Now, the first 14 months of that is uh, um, believed it's aged in um, um, uh, in a white wine cask, um, Fumé Blanc, I think. And... Um, and then it spends another 14 months in um, an oak barrel that was previously used to um, age Canadian whiskey or, or uh, Kentucky rye or something like that. And uh, <laughs> there's a big story. If you're really that interested in the whole story, you know, you can either look at it online or get it <laughs> and read the booklet because it's just cool to see the picture of the guy. And, you know, he looks like he's been blending and drinking it his entire life and uh but but there's a lot of love that goes into this so, so. uh it looks like you've sampled it uh well um we the birthday party we had was at the shop so ah everyone so was sampling. everyone got a little taste of it and um so uh so it, to share your tasting notes it's it's um it's sipping tequila like one of the other ones we've had before but uh, it's a little bit more, uh, it's got a little more bite to it. Uh, it doesn't really have that sort of caramel thing. It's got that aged look, and that's because of the oak barrel. But um, it, doesn't, it doesn't have any preservatives. It doesn't oh, have any you. caramel uh, coloring like some of them tend to do. This is just the natural color from the aging process. And uh, you, you pour it, you pour it into a flute, and you, uh, you let it. You let it sort of open up a little bit first, and then and you make pretentious faces. Ex exactly right, and then and then you. Well, uh, cheers. cheers! Happy birthday! Thank you. See, this one has mm. a little kick. The previous one, I think. Um, did I give you the rest of that bottle of that that um, mm. the uh, Herradura? Yeah, um, the legend. The legend. The Herodura Legend is very smooth and, and more like a brandy kind of a vibe. This is a different beast. This is this is well, it's a beast. You can taste the, you know the, what, the beast is in there. There is a sherry cask influence in here somewhere. Oh, interesting. Like that's oh well, it's it's a white wine? Yeah. Eh. This is really good. <laughs> Mm. Yeah, it is. It's um. It's, oh, this is delicious. It is. It's not for the faint of heart. What's the? Uh, my eyesight is not what it once was. I want to know. Oh, here we go. Ah, almost forty-two percent ABV. <laughs> yeah, it's. I didn't think it was too high. Yeah. Um, this is delicious, guys. <laughs> so um <laughs> thanks team yeah thanks team that was i get that, it now that was that was lovely yeah and, this and, is great man yeah uh you might want to cork that up and put it on the other side of you because left to my own devices you won't that'll be my birthday well yeah we don't want it to open up too much either that's true so i'll just i'm just gonna put mm. the cork on it and and, and you're welcome to you're welcome to dive in any old time you like. Uh, what I else just is went down the wrong pipe? <laughs> <laughs> so anyhow, that's what we're drinking, mm -hmm. which is happy. So uh, now, shall we address the uh, the our miniature guitar Stonehenge we have in the background? Sure. <laughs> uh, because uh, I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna sort of play the role of the. Uh, you just drag me along by, by by my nose because. Um, well, I thought it would be interesting, you know, all of the heads on top of these cabinets. <coughs> Sorry, guys. I mm. seriously went down the wrong windpipe. <laughs> went down the windpipe. <laughs> uh, each of the four heads up there were kind of chosen for a particular reason because. They're emblematic of uh, 
different stages of your development mm. as a player, musician mm. first, mm. guitar dork, working musician, artist, all that. And then the segue into building your own stuff and the whole reason why everybody's here watching tonight, you know, where it kind of wound up. So I think it would be really cool to kind of stroll down memory lane a little bit and talk about each of these heads and why why they were chosen to be on display here. And of course, we'd start off with, oh, I got it right. <laughs> kind of the high watt. If anybody knows, I <laughs> see you fucked it up. <laughs> no matter how much I try. Yeah, so I mean, I don't want to put it, uh, I, I shouldn't be doing it with my words because it's your life, but that's where you kind of begin as a guitar player, right? Um, and anybody who's been watching the show for a while knows um, you, were, you were a drummer first, right? And then when you just decided to start playing guitar, what happened then? You didn't go out and buy the standard stuff. Well, yeah, it, it's more complicated than that because I didn't go in search of a, a new direction or anything like that. This mm -hmm. stuff just sort of fell on me. Mm -hmm. It's very weird. The whole, everything, everything from getting into music to here has the only conscious decision choice about it has been, I just love music. And there hasn't been a well. I'm going to do this for two years, and then I'm going to I'm going to play drums for two years, and then I'm going to do sure. you know, guitar, and then when once I take up the guitar, I'm going to go figure out what all the great guitar players use. And I'm going to go get that, and but it wasn't like that. Yeah, I just happened to be um, uh, the least uh, the least screw up in. In the lot of in a lot of the bands I was in, you were the least screw up. Yeah, the least of the screw ups. Okay, there. there. So, uh, I'm the least screw up. Yeah. <laughs> it's like all right, you've already been. I mean, I had the van, and uh, um, you know, I made sure we get to the gigs on time, and um, <laughs> That's I, a high bar. I had a I had a I had a, a day job. So I was making money, and I was making money playing, and uh, and I didn't blow all my money all the time. In fact, I didn't blow it very often. I had uh, when I was playing drums, I had I had a drum kit, and then I had another one. But I also had a friend that was working in a music store, so I got good deals, and and drums weren't terribly terribly expensive in those days, and um, so. I was always wheeling and dealing and trading up and down and sideways and all that. Um, just in the drum world uh, at this point. Yeah. And that just sort of slid over into the guitar world. And mm -hmm. that's how I got uh, also the, the goof offs in the band. Uh, I loaned them money and then they couldn't pay me back. And it was just like, well, here, take my guitar and hang on to it until I pay you back. And then they would disappear and I never saw them again. So. I mean, all of a sudden, I've got a Strat and a 335 and a, and a Marshall 412 and a PA system and, and uh, just microphones and stands. And, and I just started accumulating stuff because these guys couldn't, could never pay me back. So I ended up just accumulating. It's like Steve's pawn shop. Yeah, yeah. And so I would parlay that into stuff. And, and then uh, when I... When I decided to, you know, start unloading some of that stuff, and I had an extra drum kit, and I put that in the paper to sell it, and a guy calls up and says, "Yeah, um, are you interested? In, you've heard the story. Are you interested in, a, in a in a trade?" And when were you playing guitar yet? Uh, I was just toying with the idea of play, because I had a couple of guitars. I see playing around. Oh, 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 oh. Kind of as the loan shark kind of guy, yeah. and then you you just have guitars sitting around. Oh, I'll dink around with this. Yeah. yeah. So then you're selling this extra drum kit, and a dude wants to trade you. Well, I mean, it even goes farther back 
than that, it goes kind of back to early high school because um, uh, actually grade school. Now that I think about it, just go back to preschool. Let's start. Yeah, let's wrong. let's just start in the womb. Why not? Um, you don't have any past lives. My you? well, when the Beatles came out, my brother and I wanted to be in a band, and uh, so we put together a band and we argued over who was going to play what instrument and. Uh, I said, okay, well, I'll play the guitar. And he said, okay, I'll play the drums. And we got a, we got a drum, we got a snare drum and we got a guitar and we practiced. And he was terrible on the drums. So we switched. Oh, that's so the Van Halen a, brothers. Yes. And I took over the drums and he was not great at the guitar, but he could do the rhythm. He could play rhythm and uh, he could sing all right, you know. So, um, so I just took over the drums, and then I expanded the drum kit. And so that's what really started that. I, I kind of hadn't really uh, decided that I was going to do one thing or the other. It was just, eh, I'll do that for a while. You were a kid. Yeah. Like, I'm going to do what, what is inspiring me at the moment, yeah. right? Yeah. That kind of thing? Yeah. So um, then fast forward a few years later. <clears throat> I started liquidating some of this gear because mm -hmm. I was going to get another apartment and I didn't need all that junk. So I just started unloading some of it and then ended up trading a drum kit and some cash or trading a drum kit for the high watt, 50 watt head and some cash. Uh, uh, and uh, uh. I already had a 412 Marshall straight cab. Uh, uh, uh. <laughs> right? Is yeah, buddy. It was it was it was just like this. It was only it was this isn't B. This sub, is A. It's not yeah, but the same vintage. Yeah, the same year. Yeah, same year. Same year. year. Wow. And, uh, and what year is this? 74. 74. Yeah. And uh, it was it was really funny when I when I I bought that recently and uh um it wasn't working but it was wasn't working for a stupid reason and the seller was like, oh, "I'll get it fixed before." No, 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 no. No, no, no. <laughs> Don't don't do anything. And uh, so, did, did, come on. You, did you did you say it? Did you, don't you know who the fuck I no, am? No 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 no. Well, actually, <laughs> it came it came to don't me. Have it fixed. It came to me through a friend. So okay. a, a, I mentioned to a friend of mine that I was looking for one, and he goes, "It just so happened to have a friend of mine in Germany. Just happened to have." a friend in Germany that was selling this at the very time that I called him and mentioned that, you know, we do a, we do a zoom call every couple of weeks. And I just sort of mentioned that to him and he's like, Oh, so when it comes back from the shop and I go, go get it from the shop right now, go get it from the shop and don't do anything. Don't do anything. So I got it back from him. And, uh, uh, it was really funny when I, when I got it and I plugged it in and played it, I thought, well, there's so many differences between, you know, different years of high watts and there, there are so many different subtleties. And it's been so long since I played one all the time. And I thought, well, I wonder what it's going to be like. And when I plugged it in, I just felt like I just got yanked back in time. It was insane. <laughs> it was insane how much it just like got snapped back into the that DNA memory, that sense memory, that that's it. That's it. Yeah. I pulled out my, I pulled out my junior here, and plugged into it, and it was just like, oh my god, that was it. That was the whole thing. So anyway, um, uh, it's a beauty, eh? Yeah. So I had gotten that, and then I had um, uh, played. That I started playing in bands. So how many years did you play the fifty? It was one, you stepped it was one up. year. It was one year. One year, and then you did. Yeah, then I thought, yeah, I gotta, I gotta smack down the other guitar player. He's just a little bit too full of himself. Oh and, man! And uh, I thought I just need a few more watts to do that. Ah. <laughs> and so I got that, and oh man, it was such an arm load. It was just so, such. A, I was so overwhelmed by how different. And <laughs> what's really funny about that is. Uh, when Joe and I were starting to set the thing up, I had I had both of them hooked up and ready say. to go. And I said, 
here, I'll show you what I went through. Yes. And so he took he took the guitar and plugged it in to the 50 and he's he's like yeah 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 i get it i I see what you like about it i know what you like and i see how it and i can see the thread the through thread you can see the thread you know from here on (laughs) through all this other stuff yeah so then and then i said okay you want to you want to see something cool i hooked him up to the hundred and he played through it and he went oh i really see the thread i totally now i understand yeah. Everything that you said, yeah. like yeah. this, this was story time before. Right. But now you actually experiencing it and hearing it for yourself. You you had exactly the same reaction I did. I did, and and uh, the word that sticks in my head that you talked about with the hundred watt was um, threatening. Threatening. It's a threatening amplifier because the thing was when we were playing through it at first. Uh, we had the the PS100 engaged, right? It was a PS2. PS2. We had a PS2. PS2. Oh, okay. Anyway, it was way knocked down. Mm. And then he goes, okay. (laughs) I turned it off. Bypass. (laughs) Have at it. (laughs) It was just like, (laughs) boom! There's still a hole in the wall that you guys can't see here. I went, Yeah, it just has that. It was really fun to do for like two chords. Yeah. And then I'd had enough. Yeah. It has, it's that really, it, it's like going off the high dive for the first time. Mm, you know, yeah. it's like you're looking down there like, I don't know. And then you finally jump off and, okay, this is really a stupid thing I did. And then you hit the water and then you come out and go, hey, I want to do that again. It's a, yeah. Very much. Very much. But yeah, you can only take so much of that. And, and especially these days, how tuned in we are to, more of the tonal aspect of it. And in in those days, it was more about, is this going to just do the job volume-wise and blah, 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 blah. And um, so having to, having to manage that, deciding that I was going to get on top of that beast and manage that was... As a guitarist, as a working guitarist. Yeah. But then that was really, for the most part, your weapon of choice when you were working. I mean, I know you played some other amplifiers, but uh, th- this was kind of like ground level, I don't know, inspiration when it came time. Or, or maybe when you were looking at other amplifiers uh, and you were inspired to start building on your own, it was this thing. <laughs> And what this does that other amplifiers really do not do that kept speaking to you. Yeah, but I think that was pretty subliminal. I think really. Really? So you didn't go into, say, you know, building the the first pit bulls and going, yeah, I'm going to do like high watt times whatever. That wasn't where it was coming from. No, I think first of all, it was just... um, just sheer force of will. This is an interesting, different thing than everybody else that I hear does. Mm -hmm. And for that alone, I'm going to stick it out and I'm going to wrestle it to the ground someday. Um, And it was the look of it and the sound of it and the, the way it made me feel that, um, most people never played one so that they didn't have any comp- way to compare it, right? Very true. All, the, all they could say was, that's an interesting sound you got there. That's a cool sound you because got going Marshalls there. were everywhere. Yeah. Fenders, Fenders were, everywhere. were everywhere. So Everybody not being familiar with this did. and then coming like other players or e- other musicians hearing me play the first time and going, oh, so that's what that thing is about. Yeah, that sounds pretty good. That's a, that's different than what I'm used to. But yeah, you... You sound pretty good in it. You know, of course, Pete Townsend, blah, blah, blah. And of course, uh, Martin Barr, blah, 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 blah. Yeah, and yeah, 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 yeah. yeah but um, uh, I, I was too green. Those guys, you know, Pete Townsend and, and Martin Barr are, are, by this point, legends and seasoned players and full-blown, big-time touring And you weren't really and stuff. Play- That wasn't really your bag as a guitarist. Mm-mm. Right, that wasn't what wasn't the music you were playing. Well, it started out it doing, you were doing, you know, doing just you know cover bands and 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 doing all this the songs that people did. But um, 
and occasionally being in a band where you did original stuff. <laughs> oh, wait. I, I think it's, it, it's very important to mention, too. You weren't using overdrive pedals. No. Right? No. So I tried. I tried. So mal- God knows I tried. <laughs> so malcontents, fam. That's very important. Because what, what are the years we're talking about in here? No, no overdrive pedals, no attenuators, but you're playing gainy music. So how is that accomplished? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, oh my God. How, well, how do you that? I mean, you know, I mean, how, well, see, I had this, I had this idea that certain players that I respected were not using pedals. But the whole. But it thing, turns out that, like, well, I thought Mick Rouse had a great sound. It turns out he was using. A, a, oh, a, definitely. Like, if you listen to that stuff, a lot of it's kind of fuzzy. Yeah, you know? I I know that now. But I was a drummer with a with a, a a fresh new instrument and a fresh new amplifier that I knew nothing about. But here's a thing that I will say: you know, having spent that time with these high watts, that uh, was really clear to me on that day was if, if you're playing these and you're like, I really like what these amplifiers do. Like they're so, like everybody talks about clean. We weren't running them clean. Clean platform, pedal platform. No, Does it take pedals? No, well? blah, we blah, had blah, it blah, breaking blah. up, but it was, it's even when it's, uh, you know, gained up, it's wide open sound. Yeah. Wide, like the top. It, yeah. And I would just imagine like, how are you going to find an overdrive pedal that just doesn't choke the hell out of that? Well, but there, that's, that's but there weren't any overdrive pedals out it, that, at that time that didn't. Cho- mm-hmm. What uh, I think I tried, um, I tried a color sound fuzz. No, I had a fuzz face. That wasn't it. I had uh, a, a variety of things, and I finally tried using uh, uh, an MXR Distortion Plus, just mm. pff, compressed. Right, you know, just you're like, up. where did my high watt yeah, go? Yeah, yeah, where'd my where did my <laughs> dynamic sound go? Yeah, yeah. Um, but again, I was really green, just just green, and determined that I don't think the pedal thing. I tried the pedal thing. I don't think that's it. Maybe if I had had some skill and some technique and some some time, some serious road dog time on on a guitar by that time, I might have known better. But I didn't, and I was headstrong, and I was going to do it this way. And that's the malcontent thing. That, uh, out. You know, uh, still, like, I'm not going to have a Marshall. I'm not going to have a fuzz. Well, you know, what's really funny about I'm not gonna turn all down. this stuff is I, I realize now I really recognize that I do that to myself all the time. I just like, yeah. uh, you know, like I just got a big bucket full of tacks and I throw them in front of me yeah. and then I go, oh, I can get through this barefoot. And why? Well, why there. not yeah. yeah yeah you you put them there yourself yeah, <laughs> yeah. I, I'm not, I, I do that to this very day um yeah. i can relate yeah i mean with the with the uh, the streaming setup I'm, I'm like going this thing does this and this and this it should be able to do this too and i'm on the phone with the manufacturer look i just need to route the signal so that it does that this thing does everything else why doesn't it do that and uh, oh well it just doesn't you know of course i can relate to that people that contact us and go yeah i got the ps100 and it's stereo right no it's not stereo well it's got two channels no it's really got two switchable rows of settings yeah oh it's not two channels no it's it's not not two channels it's not stereo it's not stereo i can't switch between two heads no 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 why not well it's got one power it, it's this big okay to do what you're asking it'll be this big and another 500 bucks yeah. 500 bucks that's expensive yeah well we sort of figured that's what you'd say so that's why we didn't do that and um so that's having said that i want to know how many times people ask us if we would make a, a stereo power station this last two weeks it's been about eight i th- i think <laughs> Look, <laughs> I, I think you're going to have to make one. <laughs> Look, just, just give in. <laughs> I mean, that not that a part of how you decide what you're going to build? Is like uh, you, that, There's a demand there. 
to the to the extent that what see yeah maybe in the early days i would have made it when five people said they want that you know but these days you know in order to put the effort time and effort into getting it really right to make it really well and uh um well executed i should say uh you know we're like i said 18 18 months from start to finish on a new project do mm -hmm. i have do do i have a, a space in my schedule to Hey, I'm going to, uh, sorry guys, this is again, like first, uh, broadcast with all this stuff. It's difficult to see the comments. I'm just looking at them on my phone and I'm catching you guys talking about, there's a, a, a random clicking happening in the audio. Um, I'm hoping it's not coming. Is it just like moving the microphone stuff around or is it clipping? Or is it, yeah. Uh, <laughs> Brendan. Hey, Amanda. I see you. Uh, yeah, see? One, two, one, two. Oh, I see a little clipping on the master over there. I could back that off a little it's bit. It's not a mic issue, huh. Amanda is saying. Um, moving the mic fixed it. <laughs> oh, it's still clicking. Oh, uh, is it like all the time or every once in a while does it seem like it cut out and you miss a little data? Because I've seen that happen on some podcast, some broadcasts, where it uh, just kind of chops. Man, okay. Well, um, apologies. Uh, Hopefully, it's not too bad, and you're not all running for the hills. Um, we, we will figure it out. We will survive. We will persevere. We will conquer. But I'm seeing, I'm seeing us going into the red on the master. So, I wonder if backing that off a but little it, bit. But it's, it's not that, right? It's, it's a random clicking. It's not happening unless you talk. <laughs> uh, okay, we're going to engage you guys with a little bit of tech help. Steve, can you uh, mute my mic and we'll just keep yours up for a sec? Yeah. We'll see if it's yours. All right. One, two, one, two, one, two. One, two, one, two. Hello, hello. Uh, so, so that's you. That's Steve. Not doing it? Um, oh, 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 um, Wayne is saying it's possible that the cell phone is too close. Okay, I'm going to try something. I'm going to move because my transmitter for this mic is actually near the phone. Let's see if this fixes it. And uh, is my mic up again? Can you unmute me? Okay, yeah. we'll, tr we'll try this. Uh, huh. one, two, one, two. I also turned the level down a little bit so that it isn't clipping the okay the master stage and see what happens with that. All right, thanks guys for for trying to help and uh, our apologies and bearing with us. <laughs> yeah, this is the first time we really plugged all this stuff in and and fired it up so. Uh, it's, uh, BMO saying that it's your mic that seems to be clipping. Hmm. Is it doing it now? Because I, well, actually I'm running a little hotter level than you are. I think you talk. Uh, I'm talking. No, we're about the same. I turned down the, well, it's still clipping. Is a it your shirt I... rubbing the capsule? I'm wondering. Well, I, we're still clipping the master a little bit. So I'm going to knock it down some more. One, two, one, two, one, two. Okay, it's just, it, All right. like, we can't even get in, into the clipping level now. So we'll see how that works. This is embarrassing. Thanks for bearing with us, guys. <sighs> um, okay, so I'm, I'm going to continue asking you questions about this stuff. So we're kind of talking about the high watt experience uh, as a player. That's what you were gigging with most of the time. Then, At the same time, I'm learning how to play the instrument. I'm learning how to play chords. I know three chords at this point. So at I'm this still, point, you've learned more? I, five. I know five now. Damn. Cheers, buddy. <laughs> Have another sip. <laughs> I mean, uh, I don't, I don't want to, I don't want to get, I, I don't want to do a deep dive historical thing that much. I mean, we've, we've kind of, 
talked about a lot of that. Unless you guys, yeah, we, we well, we can. Let, let's do um, because if people have been watching the show, we we have talked about this stuff. And and oh, by the way, we do have a show planned where we're going to play. It's going to be high watt fest, and we're going to do that. And I think I saw one of you guys talking about uh, maybe doing a clip. Um, like me doing some sort of a demo clip with them, I'd love to do that. I'd yeah, we're gonna, to we'll that. we'll get not this episode, but we're gonna. That's that's on. We're headed there. We're that's headed coming there. up. That's yeah. coming up. We're gonna do a deep dive on that. Mm -hmm. But so, if, if we look at the chronology of the amplifiers behind us, the one, this one. Let's talk about this one. Um, well, before we talk about that one, we kind of have to talk about this one. <laughs> hey, what the hell is that? This, okay, this is. <laughs> Whoa, wait a minute. That's a chassis of something else. That's weird. That's... <laughs> Those are what power tubes? Yeah, they're power tubes. This is um, this is a twenty watt amp. This is a full blown three channel twenty watt amp. And um... but everything is on the outside. Well, yeah, yeah, because well, this looks like uh, looks like an old piece of studio equipment, right? It's got the speaker out, the line out, effects send and return, uh, foot switch jacks. Actually, has two effects loops in it: a preamp, a front end effects loop, and then an effects loop between the preamp and the power amp. What? Yeah, you're insane. You're just figuring that out. I see. The the, the 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 real salient feature on the overdrive channel is this knob here. You pull this switch and it goes into extortion mode. Extortion. <laughs> <laughs> That's how you know. Okay, so you built that. Is that the first amplifier that you built that you kind of put your you were thinking of putting your name on? Yeah. So I I was I was touring with the Dickies and I took out a super champ. Right. And I modified it because I didn't really like the overdrive. I liked the fact that it had overdrive and it was this little Can tiny I ask you a thing. Question? Why they, the super champ at that point and not the high watt anymore? Um, because I was I was touring and we were renting gear, and you couldn't get high watts all the time. So you thought like if I have a small rig, the small, a little tiny. Were you subset it of this some, ah so you bring the super champ slave it into the jcm 800 mm -hmm. that's or a mesa effect with effects loop return on, or whatever amp had an club that you're loop. playing it got it yeah so we had a we had a contract you know we had a rider and and i had to have i had to have a a 412 cab and M &M. some kind of amp with with an effects loop in it okay so there was a list of three or four amps that I had. That Did you get a, a Macia? Got a, yeah, a Macia, a Macia engineering. <laughs> I was telling Joe, like in this, in the late seventies, I went into Guitar Center Hollywood, the original Guitar Center store on Hollywood Boulevard. And, uh, uh, and they had this thing that looked like a Mesa boogie in there. But when you looked at the name closely, it, it was Macia, M-E-S-I-A. <laughs> and it was this little solid state thing that was made China or Japan or something. I don't know at that time what, but it was, it was like really trying to look like a Mesa amp, but it said Macia. <laughs> Fooled you though. Yeah. We were, we're like, what, what? No, no, no. Okay. You got me. <laughs> it's like, I was telling Steve when I was growing up, uh, we'd go to, um, the swap meets, um, and look at, uh, you know, like knockoff car stereos. Mm. And uh, <laughs> they had um, and they had all the major, uh, well, they had all knockoffs of the major brands. So, you know, <laughs> at, at the time, Alpine was like the <laughs> one to have. But like, if you go there, you'd have an Alpine with a PH. And you'd have, you know, some friends would be, check out my Alpine. It's like, no. can you read? <laughs> There's an H in there. Clown? <laughs> so anyway, it's the same same difference. Yeah, well, so Fender had come out with the Super Champ and everybody was buying these things cuz they were cute. They were reasonably priced and when you dimed them out, they were just they just were just raging. Great. Uh but once that actually came down to um playing it in the overdrive mode, I started 
getting, I started tiring of the overdrive sound in it pretty quickly. And um, of course, Fender used a really unusual tube in there. I mean, it was a cool little design, but they were also doing their little, you know, bean counter cotton cost cutting thing. Uh, instead of using two 12AX7s, wherein one of the 12AX7s triodes wouldn't be used, they decided to use a 6C11, which is a triple triode. I don't even know what that is. Nobody knows what it is. <clears throat> it was like one and a half 12AX7s. It was like <laughs> three triodes in one bottle instead of two. So they instead, get like of, a instead of using deal on these tubes, inst and they, uh, they must have because instead of using two dual triodes and not using one of the triode of the dual triode, they used a single triple triode, which were already obsolete and they were going out of production by the time they were using it. Uh -huh. Number one, number two, incredibly microphonic. Number three. The socket for them was difficult to get. This is like, why did you go down this road? Let's build an amp, guys. Uh, on the other hand, when we came out with the 2150 the first time, I was already hip to the fact that, that GE was about to shut down their 6550 production. And I just thought, we'll buy as many GE 6550s as, we, as they will sell us at a time as much as we can afford. And will and they'll last long enough that we won't have to worry about replacement and supply for a while. So, okay. so you know, there could have been that mentality at, at play there as well. But it was just a stupid tube. So the first mod that most people did was they took out that sixty ten and replaced it with drilled a hole in yeah. the chassis and replaced it with two twelve AX sevens. Then you could pick a twelve AX seven that was not microphonic for that stage, and. Yeah, you didn't. You didn't. You had a triode that you didn't use, but you had a triode that wasn't being used. And I took that unused well, and you triode. Get replacement tubes, and like you weren't stuck with this goofy. Well, I took that unused triode and I put it in. I wired it into. So you kept it in there. I wired it in front of the input stage so that it would give more overdrive before the tone control circuit. Yeah. Then it's wow. starting to sound like a raging amp. Uh, and getting a little bit of grind before the EQ. Yeah. So that was starting to work really well. And then I put a little load resistor inside it. So it had a, I think they came with a, they came with an eminence and they also came with an EV uh, Force 10. So I had the one with the EV speaker in it, which just made it really in your face and loud. So it was cool. But it was a little crisp and a little stiff. And uh, it was 66 amp. So, in addition to the overdrive mod, I put a different lead master on it so it actually would have a separate gain and lead master control as opposed to the clean sound instead of just one knob that you sort of had to Mickey Mouse to get it in the right clean. spot. Just use your volume yeah, 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 mod. yeah. But it, well, that, the, that was the problem with it. It's like when you put it in the overdrive mode, it was just full bore and you could only dial it back a little bit. It wasn't something that you could dial it. Okay. Bear yeah. Hunt Vision sets. What? That was the Stephen Turing circuit. <laughs> it was. My brother, <laughs> thank you. Well, that was a legit Turing circuit. <laughs> so I put EL34. Sorry, old, old malcontents inside joke. Uh, yeah, I, I put EL34s in that. Uh -huh. And uh, it, wasn't a, it wasn't a really great match for EL34s, but I'd like to sound better at the time. So I did that, and I put an 8-ohm load resistor inside so that when you unplug the speaker, it would feed the 8 ohm load. So yeah. it wouldn't make any sound. And then I put a line out on it, and I would run that into the effects return of whatever amp we were on tour. Right. So I had this little box. I had my Esquire, and I had my little box that I carried, that I toured with. Whatever town we rolled into. That Esquire. Yeah. That one. Uh, I would plug into that, and I just was very comfortable. The whole tour, I just was like, I have a reliable, trusty sonic partner here and it's great um and then fender turned around and discontinued it um so when i at the time i was um i had just left valley arts and i was working at this other repair shop where i had a lot more free time to screw around and uh, they actually gave me the the keys to the place so i could work there on my own hours whenever i wanted so i would often go there at start working at midnight and work all night and then leave in the morning 
and I would do in deference to the business, I did all the repairs, uh, uh, you know, a day's worth of repairs so that they could pay their bills. And then I did several hours of goofing around on my own stuff. Mm -hmm. And uh, I built that. Uh, I started the, 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 it actually started at Valley Arts, but I actually kind of, it came to fruition at, at uh, Music Tech because it, it was just tailor made for me. I could stay there all night long and tone, tone test it and beat on it and figure it out and refine it. So I basically took the whole Super Champ concept, but put a real overdrive circuit in it and a really good effects loop. And channel switching that really worked and three distinct channels that were usable and i made it rack mountable so all i had to do was put it into the power amp section of any amp and at the time mm. i had a couple of 100 watt high watt combos mm. with what, what were in those combos what were the speakers evs oh, <laughs> Yeah. No and it, way. And it was great. I mean, that's all. I mean, that's the like the obvious choice, actually. Well, I mean, right? it was, it, with a with a DR, it was basically a DR one hundred three upside down in a little one twelve box. So the the EV twelve L was the only speaker. Exactly. You, that's you the could, only speaker that could deal with that, right? Yeah. Yeah. And uh, um, not that I'd want to hear it. Being but I actually, I actually blew a couple of twelve Ls in that amp too. Um, <laughs> But um, Dude, I would not want to be in a mm, band with you. <laughs> well, but I had it under, I had it under control because I had all the overdrive coming from the little guy. So they were basically just power amps at that time. Okay, and that's what led me to the you know would be great is just to have like a pretty clean stereo power amp in there with this preamp, and then patch in some effects and stuff, and that would be awesome. And then I discovered that I kind of was I, I discovered that there was this guy Bob Bradshaw that was doing this kind of thing and and uh, but you're uh, literally uh, every step of along every step along the way of this evolution is just trying to solve your own problem. It's not like let me develop products you know that I'm eventually going to sell. You're just having ideas about this would work better for me on my own gigs. It's still that way. It's still that way. I have a problem I need to solve. Mm. Once I solve this problem for me, I've solved it for however many other guitar players I'm sure Got it. are dealing with the same issue. Got and it's it. it's always been that way. So so how far away from this you said it's a twenty yeah, the, the tubes, twenty mm -hmm. watt amp. Mm -hmm. Uh how far away from because it says pit ball on the front. Mm -hmm. How far away from this is this? Uh, it's actually not far. This originally didn't say Pitbull on the front. Did it say something? Was it called something else? Yeah, it was called a... a uh, was it dumb? It was totally dumb. <laughs> I, I, we, you want to know how dumb? Yeah. Well, come, come on. Yeah. Some, somebody's got to say, how dumb is it, Steve? <laughs> I, I, need to, I need to see that. I'm waiting. Yeah. <laughs> Come on, you can do it. Let's just pretend. Okay. What was it called? It was, it was called a custom high champ twenty. A custom high champ twenty. Yeah. Well. And it was engraved using the same engraving technique as the custom high watt one hundred right there. I mean, the same font. The same. It's it, it's better than you know. Naming it the, you know, the angry raccoon or something. Yeah, yeah, like, yeah. like, like th there, there's a, a a logic to it. Given, yeah, I mean, it's it not it's, it, it's not horribly embarrassing, but it was kind of goofy. But then when I got the idea of, <laughs> of the of the, uh, well, the high watt one twelve combo was called a bulldog, and oh. and I thought, well, a, a pit bull can beat up a bulldog, so. <laughs> <laughs> See that is that sounds like you think that's even cornier, which it probably is. <laughs> it, it is. <laughs> it speaks to however old you were at the time. Yeah, uh, yeah. My yeah. amp's gonna beat up this thing. Yeah, really. Yeah, yeah. Well, hey, you know, it's gonna have two T's. 
<laughs> well, it was it had two T's because Hi Watt had two T's. Okay, and then see, there's the thread through all of that. Yeah, yeah. Man. Is that why it has two T's? Yeah. Wow. Yeah. I mean, look I at like the that. look at the font. It's uh -huh. the same font. Yeah. That makes sense. Okay. Um, yeah. So. So uh, what, what what's going on? What's going on with this? That is, remember the uh, the prototype that we when we did that when we did the sound sampling with the three calves and the and the and the the three heads. We had the deliverance head and we had that pitbull prototype with the right. chrome chassis. That's the chrome and chassis. We had the, and the Nelson pitbull. That's the chrome chassis. That's the chrome chassis one. That's that's the that's the original head shell that we made for it. Oh, I kind of want to pull it down and show everybody the chrome. Oh, but you can't because the panel on the back is black, right? It doesn't really show when it's in the head shell. But seriously, you you had you had we had it out. It was like set up. Okay, and you, everybody right. saw it. All right. Well, I because mean, it's some people saw it. It's it's an old Marshall chassis, correct? That it's, you a, had? it's a it's a Super PA one hundred chassis that you had dipped. In chrome, I had to completely dismantle it because I bought it. It it was it had been underwater. It was in somebody's basement in England for a while, oh, so it was cool. all rusted and it it was full of mil, mildew, and uh, it was nasty. But uh, I got it for a song, and the transformers were good, and that's all I really cared about. I needed a chassis and some transformers, and so that's got the original 1968. Um, you know, Plexi era power and output transformers in it. Wow. <laughs> and uh, so I just completely stripped it down to metal. So that was around 85, 86, about the time I got my heart, my first Harley. And I started customizing a Harley and getting parts chromed and stuff. And there was. So this... you knew the chrome dude? Well, yeah, everybody sent their chrome. Everybody sent their parts. I was going to ask, why did you do the chrome thing? Because you were a Harley guy at that time. And it was the only way to, to to get rid of all the 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 you know the oxidation and the rust and all the stuff from oh, the chassis because it was all rusty. It nasty. was all rusty and nasty. Yeah, yeah. Okay. And I had just sent everybody at the, everybody at the time sent their chrome parts, their Harley chrome parts, to Brown's Plating in Indiana, and uh, that was the place that you just and you just you just wrapped up parts. And put them in a box, bye bye. and come back chrome. and put put a shipping label on it, and send it to Brown's Plating in Indiana mm -hmm. or Kentucky or where somewhere like that. I think it was maybe it was in Kentucky. Yeah, and um, and they would they wouldn't call you and say they got it. They wouldn't send you a document saying they'd received it or anything like that. Sounds kind of like Dumble. You just send it, and then they would, they would, uh, and then the UPS guy would show up and go, "You got a COD for like three hundred and fifty dollars." Oh man! And I, I, I was going to ask how you paid for it. Is and I go, "COD, COD for three hundred fifty. Who's it from?" Uh, someplace in, in in Kentucky or Elkhart, Indiana. Or Those are kind of fun. The things that they they go out long enough that you kind of forget about them, and then when they come back, it's like Christmas. A yeah, bit. like yeah, oh, it was I forgot really all like about that. that thing. I went through the stages of loss and anger and grief. Yeah, when I thought, oh, it's never going to get done, and then here it is. It shows up. Yeah. yeah, that's fun. And I, you know, so that was that was successful, and I put all the parts on the bike, and it was beautiful, and I drove it for. A while, and I and then when I got that amp, I went. I know just what to do. Stripped it all down, wrapped up all the parts, sent them off to Browns, and they came back. Woo! And that was, you know, that was 1986. So, so here it is, 35 years later, and you know, you guys saw it. Some of you guys saw it. You saw it. Mm -hmm. It's just, it's like a mirror. Still, it's, yeah. it's pristine as the day it was done. It is. Um, it is. Of course, it was kept in a dry environment too. I didn't really polish it every day or anything. But it just stayed nice. Now that amp, um, what if I remember correctly, that was kind of like the test pit bull, right? Yeah, like you were doing all sorts of crazy yeah, stuff. Yeah, it's all rats nested out. It's not, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. It's got yeah. like. 80 pull pots and switches on it. Yeah, so, that's the one. Does it, do we want it to sound like this? Do we want it to sound like this? And then yeah. we stripped it all down. And, and so it, it had that amp sitting there, which works because we played through it and everything. 
um, it still has a lot of features that didn't make it to the production. Right. Pitbull. Well, they did actually. They just didn't make it to production as switchable features. We just went. This one's going to be this way, and this oh, one's going to be that oh, way. Okay. And then the ones that really matter that need to be accessible mm -hmm. will be accessible. And you know, as it turns out, if you look at the deliverance, that whole concept of what really needed to be accessible has been paired way, way back. Mm -hmm. um, so, and that that leads to the deliverance. And then uh, I think we had a couple of guys asking, uh, you know, what's happening with upcoming models and blah, 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 blah. And so there's this kind of whole um, rethinking or revisiting, what shall I say, um, reimagining of the, 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 the models that we're going to, like the Ultra Lead and the Sega X models that are going to come out. We that had, there's there's the tell there's the giveaway those are coming up yeah and they've been coming down the pike. we've been talking about them coming up for the last two years and everybody knows why they haven't you know but um interestingly in the time that we announced that we were going to re reintroduce those models we've had a pandemic we've had uh What's that? Uh, we've had a shutdown. We've had a show where we hash things out and talk about stuff. We've revisited, you know, past design episodes and and concepts about what designs are about, and it all that interestingly is leading to uh, a sort of new set of thoughts about how best to reimagine those models rather than just well that's why this one in particular exists because actually because of the one that far one or or not that's not why that exists but a part of what's happening in the series too that's right because we did the deliverance 120 and 60 uh-huh in 2004 and then we did the the sound city amps in 2015 16 those those came out and so some of the some of the sonic ethic of the sound city slipped back into the d120 it didn't really make a big big difference as anybody that has the series two knows it's just sort of an uh an enhancement and a refinement of the original design and a couple of little additional features that people really wanted to have so just as a practical matter it, they, it made sense <laughs> to include those in there. Uh, and now a similar sort of mindset is starting to, uh, is starting to present itself in the thought process of the ultra lead. So it's going to be, I can't tell you what it is because it's still percolating, but it has to do with what is the essence of the ultra lead? What was the essence of the deliverance? What was it that made people really glom on to mm -hmm. that amplifier? It's, mm -hmm. it's essential DNA, it's personality, the thing that makes you want to play through it. What is that? Mm -hmm. And if we take the approach that, well, it had it did all these things, that's kind of missing the point. It was really that it did this one particular thing in a real in a really distinct way. Mm -hmm. So if if we're we're if we're embellishing and enhancing that what is that what is it that we're doing to accomplish that and uh it, that's it, that's that that's the new that's the that's the new um that's the new paradigm that's sort of what kind of uh, uh, kind of taking place on everything i think i'm curious maybe it's different for both of these models but the ultra lead's got a lot going on mm -hmm. the sig x has a lot going on mm -hmm. When you think of the evolution of each one of those models, is it a let's pack in more features kind of evolution? Or is it we're going to distill it down to more of its essence? Or do you go one direction with one of those models and then go the other direction with the other one? Like that, I could see the rationale for both ways. I'm just wondering if you know yet which way you're going to go with both of those. First of all, I want to just say one thing. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm really digging this new format so much. 
already because there isn't this mic dropping out and and these funny echoes and all this stupid stuff that we've had to deal with in the past just being able to just have this conversation in in real time and not have these little technical roadblocks is yeah I, I hope that i hope the clicking has gone away but i mean just like yeah that's actually like um what do i want to say like problem solving number one for the next episode we actually want to figure out how to get and by the way we have a big monitor in front of us but all we see is us right now we want to get the comments on the screen so we can actually interact with you guys again um sorry i know you're saying stuff uh, but it's kind of down on the floor right now so <laughs> apologies but we're going to get that solved but but yeah it's 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 taking a hard look at what is the essence of each of those models and and how do we just sort of embellish that or bring it make it I don't know if we need to make it more better. I think the what's starting to rise up in my consciousness is not making it more better, but what what specific features are on there that nobody uses that sort of distracts, they take your attention away from the thing that it really does the best. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I I don't have a specific answer. I've got some rough ideas and but you uh, added to the deliverance in the series too a little bit. But I mean, that's a model that's ripe for that. Right, but you know, we only added the things that people specifically said they were they weren't adding uh they weren't adding a feature for adding a feature's sake. They no, were no, no, solving no, no. a problem for somebody that said it's almost there. I just need this is eh, like just 15 years it. of getting feedback yeah. off of this these instruments being out in the field and played and the consistent feedback of you know what? The amp's perfect. Yeah, and there's just a means there's a beauty in in digging my heels in because there's a flood of feedback from all kinds of people that have different ideas about what would make it better uh, versus my idea about does that really make it better so you know and and the effects loop thing i mean we purposely just dug our heels in on the effects loop no well it's it, we don't really know that that's an essential thing that it has to have maybe maybe not but then in between the time that it was produced and and the time that it was reissued there was an economic collapse. I mean, there's all kinds of things happened between 2005 and 2010 that just put everything on the back burner and 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 made us look look at the whole business a different way. So uh, it, it's just it's it's just finding we're finding our way to getting back to what we think the essence is and. And all this, as this time goes by, people's ideas about what they think would make it better or what they're happy with now that they weren't happy with before has evolved as well. Mm -hmm. So kind of like the audience is changing and we're re revisiting things and its reason to exist is, is you know, it's slightly ironic is, you know, at the time that the deliverance gets the effects loop, the power stations are like the biggest thing. Yeah. <laughs> It's like see, where's that, your effects loop, and that's that's it. that is the irony of, of all of because it. Because if I ever if, if I take the deliverance out on a gig, I, I'm, I'm bringing the damn power station, mm -hmm. you know, and I'm probably going to use the effects loop in the power station because I'm going to, you know, I'm going to warm up that power section, get that happening, you know. Yeah, but so, then there's but then there's the different strokes, right? Right, because the master volume. Mm -hmm. uh, when you turn down the master volume and run the power amp clean, that's an entirely different dynamic than than turning the gain down farther and the master up and getting more power amp saturation. Totally. Those are two entirely different kinds of players. Mm -hmm. So, um, or they're a player that that has a, a a broader palette that makes use of all of those little things. Well, that's that's one of the things that I love about the power station being a regular thing in the rig now is that an amplifier, like I can use an amplifier one way for five years. And then you kind of, you know, when you start to get a little bit of the seven year itch with your gear, you're like, yeah, maybe I want a new amp. You're like, no, now I can just really start using the power section or maybe I'll stop using the power section. Let me just mm. use the master now. And it becomes a different experience, right? Yeah. The, 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 
the the spice that's that's been in your spice rack for 10 years that you haven't opened yeah, yeah and you go oh let me try this you open it up it's like oh it's useless it's all hard you can't even get it out but i really want to try chipotle on something so you throw that one away and you go to the grocery store and you get a fresh chipotle and you go why didn't i try this like five years ago right and then you know for the next seven months it's like in everything yeah it's in margaritas. It's in cat food. <laughs> uh, so, it's, it's in my Vicks Vapor Rub. Yeah, a little Chipotle there. That'll take care of it. Yeah, baby. So you, what you're kind of saying, okay, okay. Let's frame it this way. 2022, if you had your druthers, the Sig X and the Ultra Lead mm -hmm. would happen this year? Oh, what, what we've basically done what we always do, which is, you know, lay it on the table to get it chopped off, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and, I mean, that, I, that's how I prefer to do things. <laughs> I just commit and like, you know, it's the, uh, uh, I'm say it, it's the, um, it's better to beg for forgiveness than for permission. Yeah. Right? <laughs> yeah. Like, look, I didn't get it done, but I tried rather yeah. than, well, maybe we won't say anything. It's like, no, dump it all on the fire and go for it. You know? Yeah. The, the, but everything is so cyclical now because there's so many. Well, it's a wonderful position to be in where there's so many things to think about. There's so many projects that we're working on that people are interested in there's so many things happening in music where uh some of these newer fresher ideas are uh, appropriate and and more applicable there's all kinds of it's it's a perfect time to be uh uh coming up with new ideas and designing new products it's a perfect time for that and also i just the ideas just keep welling to the top um and it's 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 just an amazing time. It's it. I haven't felt this enthusiastic about trying things and understanding what people want and listening to fresh ideas about music and all of that. It's 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 been since the since the eighties that it's been like wow. that. And then there's and then there's the legacy artists that are coming out and they're still hitting it hard. I mean, did anybody see uh, Elvis Costello on? Uh, on uh, the Tonight Show a couple weeks ago, holy crap! He was on fire. Huh. He was on fire. He just looks raggedy and like we all do. But um, but he's and he's using the power station. Right? He's hitting it hard. He's got an AC thirty and a deluxe, and he's got a power station and this big ass pedal board, and he's just. And a, some kind of a Jaguar or whatever the guitar that he's always used. And he's ripping it up. He's ripping it up. And he's got some of the original guys in the in the attractions, the drummer, the bass player. And they're, they're just uh, – a friend of mine from, from uh, in Albuquerque texted me. He says, did you know that Elvis Costello is using a power station? I go, yeah, I knew that. He says, and he's on this nice show right now. And I'm like, what? And so switch the channel and and – watching it on the big screen and it's like, wow. What, I mean, I've, we've, we've got photographs of him using it and uh, we have a relationship with his equipment guy. Um, but to see it on the night show, it's just like, that just goes back to the old days of seeing um, um, uh, oh God, uh, Living Color. Um, <laughs> I've just been informed my mic is out. Oh, I wonder if mine is. Oh, it's getting there. Um, I don't, I uh, Vernon Reed, y you know, on 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 Letterman using the uh, using the twenty one fifty. So um, we need to get you a cable so that your mic is powered. A long USB, or we could turn on the uh, the, the room mic. I've got. Um, so professional. Yeah, we're we're total screw ups on this. We we didn't know how many hours we were going to get out of these mics, but now we know. Yeah. Not a complete show. Yeah. 
I wonder if we, uh, I wonder if we go in with this. No, there's no place to put it in there. While you're up, we might as well do two since you're just going to run out. Yeah. Well, how far in are we? Seven, eight, twenty. Crummy thing. Uh, where's the cable? Where's the cable? I had them right here. Thanks for hanging in with us, guys. Let me see your. Uh, uh, is that it? That is yes. Okay. Success. Okay, then we need a charger thing, which I've got laying around here somewhere. Where is that little? Oh, it's over here. Yes. Now, will that reach over to here? Um, let's try. If it looks unwieldy, that's okay. No, it's wieldy. It's not unwieldy. It's definitely... Oh, I got this right here. All right. Great. Do you have a green light? I have a red blinking light. Let's see if... Uh, am I getting... Okay, I'm still dead, but I'm going to turn me on again. And... Uh, yeah. All right. It's blinking green. Yep. I'm just not coming in through the... There yet. Are we losing the power over here too? So maybe, uh... yeah, you're. This one's getting ready to go south too. Um, okay, I'm gonna disconnect for a second. One, one, yeah, one, 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 one. Okay, guys. Um, no sound now at all. Um, still no sound, no sound, no sound, no sound. Camera one on. Uh, sound is back. Okay. All right, cool. So I think the sound back is coming from the room mic, so we can yeah. turn these the lab mics off for now. All right. Does it sound okay? Can you hear us clearly? Can you hear the can you hear the two boobs sound now? All right. All okay, right. it's not going to be the fidelity that we had. And it's going to be a little echoey, but um, okay. Tough all right, shit it's okay. Say. Kelly says it's okay. Yeah. All right. Thank. Thanks, guys. Thank all you. right. More cables. Got to buy more stupid cables. Yeah. Or we'll address that. Yeah, some other way. Good. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I was talking about um, a Vernon Reed using the, the twenty one fifty power amp uh, on the uh, on the Letterman show, the in in nineteen ninety, and basically just put us on the map. And so seeing the uh, seeing Elvis Costello using a power station was awesome. Yeah. And uh, so there's there's a, you know there's just a lot of that. It's exciting, uh, but I feel like you just you know. You guys have have been uh, really gracious about telling us that you wanted. When is the show going to come back? And we get customer support emails. Oh, I need a I need a replacement set of tubes. And uh, which speaker do you recommend for blah 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 blah? And uh, when's the when can I get a four twelve cabinet? And by the way, when's the show coming back? We get a lot of that, so it's been really encouraging to hear that. And part of the part of the show is sort of like an, an overview and a catch up and all that. So, what do, what what do you guys? Well, wait, 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 wait. Those are amplifiers. What else is coming out this year? <sighs> we don't have to go on too much longer. We can wrap this up, but there's a couple other things. There must be. It's like the new Fryette. Orange juicer. Yeah. The Vita Vita Vegemin blender. Well, in, in keeping with 
in keeping with you <laughs> being the complete boobs that we are tonight, where's where's the power loop? <laughs> I know it's here someplace. Um, I see an old version. No, there's a new one here. There's a new one here. Must be in the green room. <laughs> ah. Is this an unveiling of sorts? No, I think you've you've held it up a prototype before. That's production one. Yeah. So uh, Steve is looking for the PLIR um, that is going to be released imminently. And uh, <laughs> he can find it. You got it? <laughs> so professional. <laughs> Since when did we ever profess to be professional? All right. So anyway, there's this thing. It's called a PLIR. <laughs> yeah, it's around here someplace. It'll poke up, poke its face up into the top very and shortly. And it's this sure. close. It's this close. No, it's done. It's done. Well, we're it's actually... this close to being in everybody's hands. Right. Yeah. No, we're shipping it this month. Uh, we put a lot of time into that. Um, I, I noticed a couple of uh, comments in the, some of the forums uh, about um, um, what the status of the power load is and what's the cause of the delays. And somebody commented um, that they hadn't heard anything about any design changes. Like, they were waiting for us to say, oh, we've decided to change this or modify the design. Oh, like this is why it's taking this so long? This is why it's taking right, so long. Right, and, right, right. And, and the reason that you haven't seen any comments from us like that is because that's not the case. That's not what held it up. What held it up was just the thing that's holding everybody up, um, which is shipping delays and parts acquisition delays and all that kind of stuff. So... Um, uh, you know, all that stuff aside, we didn't we didn't uh, change anything from the remarkably the power load that we announced is coming out as we announced it the feature set as we designed it and um, uh, and we're going to start shipping it pretty soon. The the one final step that we had to go through to complete it was the uh, the IRs because it's PLIR. It's got an IR loaded. It's got the same analog cab that it had before and all the same feature set that it had before with the inputs and outputs and all that. Mm -hmm. And uh, the, the only thing that really changed was we improved the power supply, improved the, the audio quality, um, the, the signal to noise ratio and the, the, the signal, the, the dynamic range of the input and output stages. Uh, and the, um, well, at the time the power load first came out was about the time that the first power station came out. So, um, the power station, uh, reactive load part evolved in the period between the PO1, the power, the PS1 and the PS2. Mm -hmm. So we had made some, you know, little minor uh, changes and improvements in that. So the new power load gets those little subtle improvements. Mm -hmm. But the main thing was, is the audio quality overall, the the, the headroom and, and, and a better headroom with, with less possibility of distortion and lower noise floor and a higher quality headphone output. Still has the same stereo effects loop that you plug into the headphone circuit. So when you listen to, uh, when you plug a head into the power load, and then put on headphones, you don't hear that ratty fizzy sound anymore because it goes through um, the headphone amp and then uh, it goes through the effects loop, the stereo effects loop, and then to the headphone amp and then to your headphones from the IR part of the power load. Um, the previous one, uh, the sound was generated by the analog cab. Now the analog mm -hmm. cab is really nice for clean stuff and low gain stuff and 
layering and and um, I agree and padding I agree. and stuff like that. But uh, it's not that great for overdrive sounds, which because a big part of overdrive sounds is the behavior of the speaker. Sure. Uh, the speaker is way, way, way less important in creating a really nice clean sound. And most most clean sounds are, are fender based and the speakers tend to be scooped out and the amps tend to be scooped out. So um, actually IRs don't work as well for clean sounds as analog cabs do. So that's why we kept the analog cab in the PLIR. Uh, but it's also why we didn't feed it into the headphone amp because most people that are going to use the headphones want to rip, man. They're going to want to rip. Yeah, they want to put a nice big room reverb in the effects loop yeah. and crank it up a little bit and beat the shit out of the amp and get this big I'm raging in a hall vibe. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Not too many people are like, oh, I really want to express the, the clean. Into the head. You know? <laughs> I mean, you can do that. You can right. do that. There's actually a way that's, to do it. That's not really what you're buying um, a, a, any sort of attenuation product. That's for, right. right. But there actually, it turns out there actually is a trick way to patch it. If you decide to do that, you can take the you can take the analog. And I just thought of this. And this isn't the cool thing about the power station. Is like we keep finding trick, fun, little new things to do with it. They're like. Hey, you know what? And and I just I just realized the power load. If you do want to have the analog cab come out the headphones, you take the line out of the analog cab and plug that into a stereo reverb, mm. and then you plug the stereo reverb out into the effects returns of, oh. the, of the loop. Yeah. And then that comes Shazam. out the headphones. So that bypasses because the, the IR. loops feeding the headphone out. Yeah, and the yeah. IR is feeding the headphone the the, the loop feeding. send. Right. So if you take the the so line you're bypassing out, the IR bit. You, that yeah, way. you're bypassing uh, the loop send and using the the analog cab line out as a loop send instead. Right. So <laughs> that's funny. We haven't even gotten that question yet. We got an answer. So I can hardly wait. <laughs> <laughs> So, uh, so now there are there are custom IRs for it, and that was the thing that I was probably most uh, personally you were because it hasn't been your domain. Yeah, yeah. Like, let me create my own IRs. Yeah, and you're like, I know how to build the shit out of shit, but like IRs, because you were gonna do them. On your own, right? I was, and once I got into it, I thought, "Yeah, I could do this. I could wrap my head around it. I could spend some time. I could, I could do all kinds of things." But at the end of the day, there are a lot of IRs out there already, and people have a wide range of opinion about what's good and what's not good about IRs, and what's good and not good about them is that there are so many that are bad and it takes so long to sift through the good ones to find the best sounding version of good ones that it just creates this insane option anxiety when you know which of the 50 celestia vintage 30s out there is the best one you know it's insane um so when we're thinking about doing irs we're thinking well we don't use vintage 30s we don't use any celestians really mm -hmm. And that's like a key element of the sound of our amps anyway. And so what we're going to do with the power load is we're going to put the fat bottom cab, the deliverance cab, the sound city cab, the fame F seventies, the P 50, the, and then we, we went all the way and put the, the ether, the, the ether speaker, which turned out really cool. Yeah. Uh, a, a 60 watt, Alnico speaker that's sort of like in the same class as the as the Celestian Blue, but fame, you know, that that more balanced, you know, sonic territory that, that, yeah. that the fame occupies. And that's the fame um, thing. So I thought, not only do we want to showcase all of our cabs and our speakers, but 
I think that the, this is like a great opportunity to, for people to actually listen on the fly immediately uh, uh, what the characteristic of, of a familiar speaker like a Greenback or a Vintage 30 is going to be relative to what a um and it, it's it's not it's not a what's better it's just like well now you can actually hear it you can actually hear you what's know? what it's rather than people talking about well there's fanes on that record yeah well, yeah but you actually hear what's good about it yeah and yeah. uh and why it's and, and 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 why we're so into it you know why mm -hmm. why we think it's important so um so we loaded it up well first of all once I realized that what we really need to do is get the best expression of these cabinets that we can get mm -hmm. and do it in such a way that won't delay the delivery of the, of the PLIR anymore because it's already so late. Um, it just has to be able to, again, like you said, not, we're not trying to best anybody. We're just trying to present these speakers in their best right. light. So you so call in the wolf. Huh? So you call in the wolf, call in the wolf. Yeah. Yeah. So we I called my, my, our, our, our good buddy, uh, Michael Nielsen and asked him to, to, uh, sweep some caps for us and, and, uh, apply some of his, uh, you know, experience and knowledge, which is really, it's, this is really funny about that. Two years ago when we were finalizing the power load IR, and I thought of, I thought the same thing. I thought, okay, we need to get this done. We need to get this done. Uh, I need somebody to take the IR part of the project off my shoulders because it's going to bog me down. First person I called was Michael Nielsen. And his response, ah, I'm not really into that. I don't know anything about him. You know, I, blah, 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 blah. And, uh, you know, you got to find somebody else. And I've talked to a couple of different people and, and but I, but I was really surprised at his response. He was just like, ah, it was really funny. And, um, um, but in having a conversation with him recently, I, I just said, what, so what are you thinking about IRs these days? And he's like completely 180 degrees different attitude. Like, oh yeah, I'm doing this, I'm doing that, blah, 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 blah. I'm still using it. I'm still using the, the power load, the PL1. I still use it all the time, but I use it, um, you know, with some of the calves that I made and blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, great. Would you be interested in helping me out and, and, and sweeping your calves and, and, and doing all that? He goes, yeah, sure. Uh, I just got over COVID. Uh, so I'm a little slow, but uh, how soon can you get them over? And I said, mm -hmm. right away, whenever you're ready. So uh, we hooked up and, and curated out probably a hundred different sweeps and came up with um, a nice little uh, it's a care package yeah well just a good cross section of the various ways the various expressions of these speakers and then from mm -hmm. that we polled each other and 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 distilled that down to eight really finely crafted really finely curated curated mm -hmm. uh speakers speaker so the the fat bottom 412 cab with fane f70gs the fat bottom 412 cab with the eminence p50es the deliverance with fanes uh the sound city with the fanes and the ether cab which has mm -hmm. the the Fane Alnico 60S in it. And they're just the deliverance, the sound city and the ether one. Like I, I'm not saying I'll never use any other IRs ever again, but once I got those from uh, Michael, I, that's all I've been using. Like, ah, you know, and I finally got, uh, you know, I finally got to sit down and go through all of them and the, the best thing about it was when we finally got it all done, we finally sipped it through the best ones. And then I finally got some alone time to sit there with my guitar and amp cranked into the power load and listen on the headphones and strum a guitar. I didn't go, Oh my God, that's fantastic. I went, 
oh my god, that's those speakers that I've been working on. Yeah, that have been the lifeblood like, of oh, my speaker design. My amp. Oh, 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 yeah, yeah. it's them. You know, it's yeah, like it yeah. shouldn't have been yeah. such a revelation, but it was because I guess, I guess I felt like there's just so much white noise out there about what's a good one. And what's the right one? And, and you know, one of the really cool things the and... about uh, it being kind of a fame based project with balance kind of being, you know, the overarching descriptor of, of the fame sound is like you're not dealing with uh, the stuff so much that makes IRs stinky, you know? The super, um, you know, the, the pokey outy frequencies, the stuff you're like, ah, 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 you know, that keeps you scrolling. Like all of these are eminently usable, like now. You know, that's, there's, that's there's exactly how I feel. Pokey about it. or harsh or, you know, it's like we talked about before. I mean, there, there is such a thing as having certain tools that you're not going to use every single day because they are really strident and they stick out. I don't feel like any of these IRs um, that are going out with the PLIR are anything like that. They're just like anything that you feed into them is going to sound better with them, I think. You know? I, I was using them on tracks from old projects that just in my internal encyclopedia, of the crap on my hard drives, I go, oh, yeah, remember that that track that like I could never quite get to sit, you know, perfect. I open that stuff up and you know plug in one of these new IRs and I'm like, oh, solved. Here, that was really fun. Here, here's something that I discovered when I was when I was doing the the, the final QC and, and sound testing of it was um, the voicing switches on the PLIR, which are the same voicing switches that are on the the PS2 and the PS100. The reactive load voicing yeah. switches. Mm -hmm. yeah. And uh, you know, we get a lot of people like, oh, I like the middle position. You know, Friedman. I, I put him in the middle position. Uh, Pete Thorne. Yeah, middle position. Middle position. What is middle position or flat? You know, mm -hmm. and and I listen to that and I go have to go back to the power load or back to the power station and flip them both into the high positions and going. I as I've gotten older, I'm more sensitive to spiky top end sounds mm -hmm. and and being too aggressive on the top end, but still I didn't have that reaction when I put the bright switch all the way up on the power station. And this is what I'm saying about <coughs> being under an avalanche of work. It's a, I, I, I tend to get, I find that I tend to get tunnel vision about things or the obvious things just get by me because I'm doing these nine things today. And it dawned on me when I was listening to the power load was that, right, everybody that's complaining about that top position, are they're using some celest variation of a Celestian speaker. That's what I was going to say. And I'm like, uh -huh. yeah. you know, like, yeah. <clears throat> you know, you, you can get, you can get too deep, you know, in, in your own gases and, and miss things. Mm -hmm. And that's why you always have to step back and get other people's perspectives so that you don't get lost. But when I put, I put, uh, I put a, um, I put a Celestian uh, IR in the power load. Which, which one? <coughs> the, the, the slash cab? <coughs> the, oh boy, I hated the slash cab. It just sounded muddy and <laughs> It sounded like a okay. It sounds okay. It's well, supposed to sound like a thrashed greenback cab. Boy, it minute. sounds like a thrashed. What greenback. amplifier were you running into this last cab I got? This might be. Oh, I was running the, the Sound City uh, 100. Oh, I see. Cranked yeah. up pretty hot. Yeah. Where probably most people running that slash cab are kind of trying to ape that. Yeah. You know, the modded. Yeah, the modded Marshall thing yeah, or yeah. The, the or the the Jubilee. Mm -hmm. diode clipping thing um i played that slash cap thing like i can i i didn't get it to sound right with what i was playing through it but i could kind of 
orally visualize. Okay, yeah, if I was using this kind of effort, I think it might make a little bit more sense. Interestingly, I had to turn. I had, I had the 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 sound city, the master lead one hundred, the master one hundred. Mm -hmm. I had it. Oh yeah, a four five o'clock yeah. on the master five o'clock on the on the brilliant mm -hmm. volume. Mm -hmm. I had that thing up, slamming really hard. Yeah, and using the slash cap, I had to turn it down and really really clean it up to where then it started to sound like a cab that has some responsive quality to it. But the one that I liked the best was I heard to say responsibility. <laughs> the one that I liked the best was the um, the one that the one that was called the balanced Celestian, mm. the balanced vintage thirty. Oh, oh, this and is I don't, a, yeah. And I don't know how it was mic'd or what what made it balanced, but it was a a more even balanced sounding speaker, I actually like the sound of it. When I put that side by side with the F70G in the deliverance cab. Wait, I think, weren't we doing this together at the same time? We yeah. Were, we were like, oh and, yeah, there's that, 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 to me, it's the, um, the, the stressed out mid range of the, the V30. Yeah. The, yeah. The, the kind of, the, the kind of, the kind of congested mid range. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, but it had this nice thump to it. The Celestian one had this nice thump to it. And I'm thinking, yeah, I like that thump. Mm -hmm. And then I went, oh, boop. I put the low frequency switch up on the power on the power load and boom, there's the thump. In the right context, those switches actually do the job that they're there to do. Mm -hmm. You just don't think about it so much because everybody's so busy using them in another context, which they work, they work a certain way in a certain context and they work a different way in a different context. So there isn't any, like we always say, there's no right or wrong way, of course, to set those switches. You set it so you like them, mm -hmm. you know, and, mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, Dave Freeman being a Marshall devotee and his amps being what they are and his calves being what they are. It makes perfect sense that the middle position of both of those switches are right for him mm -hmm. and that he keeps the presence and depth down because he's already got enough, claw and enough thump right. out of the speaker. You're almost trying to ameliorate some of that stuff. Right. And know? I like to clear out in the speaker itself. I like the top end to not be too aggressive and the bottom end to not be too flubby because I don't like that rubbery thing. I like it snappy. But if I want the extended, uh, robust, low, low mid and low end in there, I have a way to do it mm -hmm. that doesn't that that allows this still allows the speaker to give me the clarity and the detail that I like without it being overbearing on the bottom end or overbearing on the top end. So that was a, a real great. Um, well, that's tricky because you're yeah. like, we're very similar and like we're not looking like with any, we're not fans of like this compressed kind of sound or this feel, right? Right. right. So you're looking like for uh gear that gives you like more of a full response or that open kind of thing that ka-chang right ka -ching. but it's so celestians are oh that's a difficult sell right there yeah you know yeah that's why fanes are so ideal for people right. who are kind of fans of that and 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 for, and for the, the guys stuff. and for the guys that say well why didn't you why didn't you put a, a, a vintage 30 um you know in there well if you're using IRs, you've already got the Vintage 30 in some form or another. Yeah. You can just load it in there yourself. I have way too damn many of them. Myself. Yeah. And, um, <laughs> but even the other side of the coin is what some people might say, well, you know, it'd be great just to have one in there so that I don't even have to mess with that myself. And I, I'm sensitive to, to that criticism. However, if we're going to do it, we're going to do it differently than everybody else too. We've got an artist that uses our cabs with Celestian Vintage Series. I'm not going to say who right at the moment, but um, oh, we've, I know. we've got somebody yeah. lined up that is already using that that uh, uh, fat bottom cabs and Sound City cabs. That'll be the clue. That'll be the hint uh, that uh, that he's got a relationship with Celestian and he likes Vintage Series, so he puts them those in those cabs and. He has a very distinctive signature sound, and so we're going to use, we're, we're going to get together with him and and come up with a couple of variations of those speakers in those cabs, uh, sort of geared for that style of playing, which is the heavier, you know, <clears throat> vibe. 
Yeah, definitely. And and, and definitely. then we'll offer them. So what we did was we came up with it's got 16, uh, 16 uh, banks and presets, four banks and uh, uh, four presets. So 16 locations of speakers and we're loading them with eight of our of our all time phase of all the cabs that we made in the first eight. And then we copied them over again in the second eight. So the second eight uh, presets, um, uh, presets, uh, banks three and four uh, and presets one through four of those two banks will have duplicates of the first, uh, the first two uh, banks. So you can overwrite those or, mm -hmm. and, and mm -hmm. put in whatever you want there. But we didn't want to just leave them blank because it'd be kind of stupid to have a position and have no sound come out of it. Who's that? You know, so we just we just copy them over in there and then you can mess with them and do whatever you want. Or actually you could even you could even uh uh well if you're if you're that much of a tweaker on IRs, you'll know what you can do with them and what how right, you can right, right, right. the the real fun thing about the power load now is that with the analog cab sim and the IR XLR out and the passive XLR out, that means you can take three outputs, XLR outputs simultaneously out of the power load and plug them into their own separate channels. And one of them can be uh, using an IR in your plugin one of them can be using an IR in the power load, and the other one can be either the analog cab, or you can switch off the analog cab in that mode and have a second um, uh, unfiltered but reactive load activated output that you can run into yet a third IR. So you can do everything that you even Im can imagine to do with with IRs and panning and layering and coming up with ways to get multiple tracks out of a single take without, you know, encountering phase issues and things like that. It's just, mm -hmm. it, it's just the coolest thing. And we've actually yeah. had a, a couple of beta units out, but um, Joe Barisi has been, has been uh, uh, playing around with the, with the power load beta for a couple of months now. And it's really funny. Um, <clears throat> he was like, yeah, you know, I've got a the studio, my studio, I, I, I've got all the speaker cabs I, and then mics, uh, you know, I don't really have a, mm -hmm. uh, an application for, but I'll check it out, you know? Mm -hmm. And then a couple days later, my phone is, <laughs> Hey, this thing, Hey, what, this, this, and he got all excited because when he started actually working on it, by himself without us standing around telling oh here try this try that you know him going into his his zone all of a sudden the, the feedback i'm getting out of him from on my, on my by text message is just like i had to take the phone out of my pocket and turn it off for a while because it's like i'll catch up with you later Joe. I mean, geez. but he was filling me with all kinds of great feedback about how he was using it and uh and tracking with stuff and and um so I, th I, th I think you guys are going to be really pleased when you finally get this in your hand. And it's going to be in February. It's going to be this month. We're yeah. going to the ship. Yay. Yay. All right. Well, hey. Do we want to, with that, do we want to, do we want to take any questions? I mean, I'm sure there's comments. We have, oh we, my we gosh. got to give somebody, we got to give the guys a chance to like at least be heard a little All bit. Right. Don't well, we? We're coming up on the, the, the two hour mark. Let's see. Man, that's a lot guys. I'm sorry. <laughs> Uh, well, yeah, there's some questions that aren't, I see, uh, when's the ultra lead coming here? I'm just going to go to the top while you tell a joke <sighs> or drink more tequila Then everything you say will be funny. Well, I'm sure that me. Um, sampling the tequila is going to be a lot more pleasing than my terrible jokes. <laughs> Anything good? Uh, 
um, lots of discussion about <laughs> the the mic clicking issue. <laughs> did we ever? Did we ever get? Yeah. Well, so lame. Well, we'll go listen to that because we'll have the recorded broadcast to go back and listen. Um, there's this um. There's a a, a Facebook podcaster that I listen to a lot. Her name is Heather Cox Richardson. I don't know if any of you guys ever hear of her. Here's a question. She's a historian and she's like really great. And she's, she's on every Tuesday talking about uh, political history. It's really, really interesting. And she's an educator and she's really good at it. And she's got this constant clicking thing going on, which is, she's always apologizing for it. So it's not just us. What do you got? Don't you guys ever drink beer? <laughs> Two week. <laughs> That's awesome. You know, um, I don't know about you, but I was a big beer drinker for a, quite a long time. I, I, I don't mind beer. I'm not a big beer fan. I, I, I tend to just, I make my alcohol intake count, I guess. Like, you know, if I'm going to beat up my liver, I choose to do it with stuff that I really, really, really enjoy. That's my rationale. And beer is fine, but, you know, I'd rather have my scotch. So that's my thing. Or tequila or mezcal. That's yeah, beer, stuff. beer was a – beer was a uh, – I, I just got out of the habit of drinking beer because I didn't – well, I wasn't really drinking that much anyway, and, and uh, beer wasn't certainly helping my weight situation at all. But uh, yeah, I maybe like I maybe like with with Joe. I'm more into like sampling and tasting things. Although there are really interesting beers that you sample and taste, and they're great. Um, <laughs> but you know, there's there's actually some beers that that just don't do it for me, and they're usually craft beers. Oh, really? Craft beers are usually too floral. Oh, because me. you're drinking IPA stuff. Which I know most of the universe loves them. I really don't because of that. Like bitter flowers with beer. No, no. it's not my jam. I, I just I just find that the like some of the local. Well, I mean, go travel around Germany for like a month, and then you. Where is Nico Chan? <laughs> That's a question. Actually, we're gonna have a little. Flash. And oh, Kelly B, and we don't need to go into it because this will be a big deal. But is the GPDI ever coming back? Because yes, oh yes, absolutely. The GPDI is coming back, and it's coming back with the same IR loader that's in the PLIR, uh, and it's a bunch of other improvements. The same sound, the same basic functionality. Uh, it will also continue to have the analog cab sim, and it'll have the IRs. But it'll have a much improved power supply and improved uh, audio output response like the new PLIR does. Just better quality buffers, a better quality headphone amp. Uh, but all the sonic functions will work pretty much the same as they did before. It'll just be quieter. You'll be able to turn the levels up hotter and not hear any hum or buzz or, and reduce noise. And um, uh, it'll actually operate the tubes at slightly higher voltage so they'll get a little bit more of that a realistic um, thing and uh, uh, you know that that touch sensitive feel thing like that and it'll be a universal voltage rather than um, uh, one transformer for the US units and a different transformer for mm. European units so it'll be easier to it'll be easier to operate uh, and more we had a couple of problems with the supplier of the power transformer in the free use version. Um, they, they, if you left them on too long, and sometimes the fan would stick. Huh. And if the fan stuck and you didn't turn the unit off and Oops. tap the unit on the top to kick the fan back on, the transformer would get too hot. Why is it glowing? Uh, <clears throat> Jonathan Kidd asks, and you kind of alluded to this earlier, but it's worth just answering it definitively. Um, does the load on the PLIR differ from the load in the power station? Identical now. Shazam. Yeah, it's, uh, you know, it's, okay. It's I think been so, it's, it's been so well received. There isn't, it, 
there is some reason in the world why we would mess with that. Okay, um, and then is there a way in the power load IR to record a stereo signal? Yeah, you uh, take the, um, the headphone out and treat that as a stereo line out. So you take the head, you plug in a stereo quarter inch ring tip, uh, tip ring sleeve, phone, uh, phone plug into the headphone out and have that split out into two quarter inch phone outputs and plug those into uh, line ins of your DAW and you'll have, uh, or a PA or a, a stereo power amp or whatever, and you'll have a stereo out. So you can take the, um, you can take a head and plug it into the PLIR and then put a stereo reverb or delay in the loop and then take the headphone out and use that as a, a stereo pair of line outs and run that into a power amp. Boom, done. Sounds great. Works great. All right. Final question of the evening. Brennan. Lennon or McCartney? Polly, I love you, but it's John Lennon. See, I'm, I'm going to split with you on that. I would have said that when I was younger. I'm more of a Paul dude now. Yeah, I'm all about I'm all about John Lennon. That's cool. That's cool. Um, you know, uh, uh, Lennon said that um, about all of the Beatles' output. He made a comment about their output and all the. He said that there's tons and tons of songs that have yet to be heard of all the albums that they made where the record labels remade the same stuff in different formats and reissued stuff. He says, there's a ton of stuff that's never seen the light of day yet. We wrote lots and lots and lots of stuff. And I have to give that, I have to give that to Paul because he was the workaholic. He was the guy that was on the, on everybody's day off. He was like, he was like calling up, Hey, why don't we run down to the studio? I got some ideas. And he was a big, Lennon is saying that the McCartney was a big driver of, of their, just the extent of their output because he was just like, it's that. so evident on that new documentary. Yeah. And, and, crystal. and uh, it, the other beautiful part of that is it, it goes back to the real nature of the relationship, not the one that the press, or the media or the, or the uh, the the yaposphere, you know, makes up about about them hating each other and all that stuff like oh, that. Yeah. So it's such crap. Yeah. Uh, the 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 thing that I I've always loved about Lennon is the thing that I identify with him, which is which is his um, his just totally headstrong contrarian. That's the malcontent. The malcontent. He was the malcontent and, and, of and the Paul's Beatles. Paul's not that guy. Paul's definitely like. I'm not, I think I relate to him a lot more now because I realize I'm a lot more like that. You know, I understand where he's coming from. Um, I'm looking at your clock. Out. Oh, I know. Uh, there's, there is another question here and it's about, I'm going to screw this up. Let me see. If it <laughs> the guitar. Yeah, I did it right. This guitar. No, damn it. That, this guitar. Yeah. Um, we've talked about it before, but what is it? Oh, it's a it's a fret king. It's a fret king. It's kind of a it's it's kind of a weird take. Um, uh, uh, Trevor Wilkinson. Yeah. His his twist take on a on a on a Firebird kind of a thing. Um, a fret king, I understand now, is no longer in existence. Hmm. Um, it seems like they they but that guitar is right there seems like they called it quits a couple of years ago but i've had the guitar for like 10 years um, uh it's just i didn't really know that i didn't really know anything about them it was a they were they were pretty big in in europe and in england and uh so trev wilkinson designed guitars for the fret king company and so he designed the pickups and he designed the bodies and he specified the woods and he did all that stuff. And that they produced them in, in uh, Korea, I, I believe. And 
it's just the nicest guitar. And when I'm, uh, he came up to me at the, uh, at the Frankfurt uh, Music Messe in Germany about uh, probably, I don't know, 15 years ago. And uh, he needed to borrow an amp. And uh, so we loaned him an amp for his booth. And um, the next time I saw him was at NAM, And he came over and uh, uh, he said, um, he said, yeah, we, we'd like to have an amp for our booth here too. And I said, no, no problem. Take whatever you need. And uh, I said, and, and I like that. I like that Firebirdish kind of thing you've got there. And he says, oh, I'll bring you one over. And I said, great, because I like to have one in our booth. So we had it in our booth. And then um, the, at the end of the show, uh, one of their guys came over uh, to return the amp. And I had the guitar in the case and I handed it back to him. And he says, what's this? I said, it's your guitar back. And he says, well, they didn't tell me to bring anything back. And so, uh, <laughs> so I went down to their booth as they were tearing down and went, Maybe your guy didn't know, but you loaned me this guitar and thank you very much. And, and they're like, oh, no, no, no. And I'm like, really? And, uh, do, you, do you want an amp or something? Oh, no, we don't want to We don't want to fly that stuff. That's what I anymore. figured. They're just trying to dump everything. Yeah. And I went, really? You're just like unloading this? Okay, great. And it's 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 mahogany, but it's got that sort of Karina sort of taste to it. It's a wonderful guitar. I love playing it. It's amazing. And I was having a whole lot of fun with it. I'm just going to get this one little thing in because I have to. I was having a ton of fun playing it because it was really playable and had a nice vibey sort of spanky thing. But then the other day I asked um, my good friend uh, Bruce Nelson, who is uh, Dean DeLeo's guitar tech, um, to have a look at my Les Paul Jr. Because... Um, uh, I played it um, on one of the shows, and you guys seem to really like the sound of it, and Joe really liked the sound of it. This is when we're doing the show where he's in his apartment, and I'm in my man cave, and I'm like, I played that, and I played this, and I played something else, and Joe was like, that's the one, that's the one. I'm going, you're trying to tell me that you heard the harmonic sort of ringing out of this guitar over the Yes, screen. I did. It was very and, clear. And he was like insistent on it. So I thought, I pulled it out and I played it a bunch and I started thinking, you know, it's nice, but it, it's got some things that are wrong with it. <laughs> it's old. It, it's old. It's nice, and, but it's old. And I was looking at it really closely and I noticed that the tailpiece was tipping forward because uh, as I learned later, the... Um, uh, the uh, the tailpiece anchors were shorter when they first started making these guitars. They didn't go down as deep in the wood, and so the string tension would gradually pull the bridge towards the pickup mm. and kind of screw up the intonation and stuff like that. So I asked Bruce about it, and he says, oh, I don't want to touch that. That's a really touchy operation. I've heard bad things about it. So I, I called a couple of different people, and he called a couple of different people, and he even called the guy that I bought the guitar from in 1992. Because yeah. this is this is how old. I don't know if you mentioned It's a 55. It. Yeah. So there's a reason why Bruce is like, uh. Yeah, but Bruce makes really nice. Oh, Bruce is amazing. Style guitars, right? But, so, so I go, I, he's my go-to guy. And I'm like, Shh. he's like, mm, I've heard, I've heard scary things about that. So I talked yeah. to a couple, I talked to Mike the Temple, who's supposed to be really good at this. He's a junior player. And he said, Dude, look how old the guitar is. And and it's only moved that much. I sent him pictures of it. He says, just leave it alone. Play. You don't want to mess with that. And I'm like, this guy saying you don't want to mess with it? All right. So then Bruce calls back, and he had done some research, and he talked to the guy uh, that I bought the guitar from who uh, has a lot of expertise in this stuff. He still buys and sells, and he's a collector. And... Uh, he kind of gave Bruce a little, like, hey, you know, Bruce, you can do this. And so Bruce calls him back and he goes, you can do it, buddy. Yeah. So Bruce goes, you know what? I think I'd, I'd like to have a, a look at that guitar. So I gave it to him. And it originally had um, shallower tuning heads. Somebody had changed the original tuning gears to shallows. And he goes, well, first thing you need to get rid of the shallows because they're not that great. And he says, uh, you know, the stock bridge, they make a... a you know, a wraparound that's compensated, is slightly compensated. It's really subtle. It's just like you see a little sort of hump, mm -hmm. but it, it doesn't look like 
you know, pretty sad. You're not going to notice right, that right. if you're, you know, and, uh, four feet away. And he said that there, and he's got these longer uh, bolt anchors yeah. that the wood is actually drilled down far enough for a longer anchor. Oh, it but is. They, but they used oh. a really short one, and that's why it was tipping. So oh. he put the longer anchors in it, put this new tailpiece on, and the other part of this, if, if you look in there, you see that little groove right there? Yep. This is two pieces. So you put the you put the bolt in the anchor, and then you screw this screw into the top, mm -hmm. and it locks the wraparound tailpiece in place because normally there's a little play in, right, the, right. in the tailpiece, and it sort of rocks back and forth in that in that spacing. Mm -hmm. So this way you get to lock it down. Yeah. So that gives it a lot better string contact to the body than the original one did. Yeah, the resonance is going to be better, the stability overall, like the tuning is going to be better, and the overall, like, how long it's going to last in that state yeah. is better. So. Yeah, and then he said, and and by the way, Klusen, I said, I have the original tuning gears. He says, yeah, but they're worn out, and Klusen is making the, a much better tuning gear these days that's got a, a better gear ratio on it, and the accuracy is much better, and they're already, they make them already aged. The relic, man. So he put them on, and and look, it looks like they got the, the original tuning gears back on it. And I took it out of the case, and I, exactly the same thing happened when I played the first chord. And it is happened when we played that little humbucker junior thing that he yeah. made for Dean. Yeah. Know? Just like, oh, let me feel it. It'll, it'll just flip when you, when you play the first chord. Give me a, yeah. Oh, yeah. It's just, you know what? It's the sound and resonance of old. It really is. You know? Yeah, it's got that, it's got a nice ring. The wood's and, old and dried out. And See, you said you liked the mid-range of it, and I did. But to me, it was lacking that low-end resonance and the sparkle on the top. And that all came back when you fixed that. So I plugged that into the, I plugged it in at the 50-watt high watt, and I just went, God, I felt like 20 years old again. I, I would have thought that the the neck would have been chunkier. I mean, it's not it's not uh, shallow by any stretch. That's really nice. Yeah, it's just but, the right amount of chunk. It's not but uh, it is not um, if you play like Gibson historics um, that are date from this time. I mean, those the necks are true baseball bats. Yeah. This is not that. Yeah. Yeah, it's just so. I'm all stoked about playing it again now because awesome. I'm, not worrying, I'm not worrying about that. Brief. And and for the first time. I don't have an excuse to be playing out of tune because the, you always had to flat the G string and you'd play it a certain way and it always had this sort of slightly out of tune sort of angst that I liked. And I thought, man, if it loses that, but now that it actually has some intonation, it still sounds really good without being, you know, super dialed in on the intonation. It's just that is just it's just far out enough to be a junior and in and more in enough to to not get bitched at by the other guys in the band. I want you to tune your guitar. So it's, it's uh, yeah, it's, I'm psyched. I'm way psyched. Man. What a cool guitar. So man. that ought to be. Time to get the hell out of here. Time to Here's get the hell out. Pick. Thank you guys for indulging. Thanks for coming back. Thanks for uh, <laughs> encouraging us to come back. Uh, and, um, Apologize for all the, the, the usual goof offs, but um, you know we had to we had to shake out the machinery and figure out how it all works, and uh, we're probably and we didn't do it right, but that's okay. And and we'll be back in two weeks, and we're gonna do it not right again. Yeah, because <laughs> that's what we do. All right, let's get the hell out. Walk that way. Walk this way. Walk this way. Walk that yeah. way. All right. So it's like exit. Stage left. We have one little special thing for you guys, so don't go away. You guys ready?